Hello again, everybody. It's been a while since I've done one of these. I'm going to try to do more as the semester gets further along. Before we begin, let me take out a poll here. How many job applications have you filled out so far? You don't have to answer this if you don't want to, obviously. I'm not forcing anybody, but I'm going to do a couple bands of different options. I wager most people are probably falling on zero, but we'll see. Well, someone asked, who is Chesterton? I will explain momentarily who Chesterton is. Looks like most people who have filled out any job applications have filled out one to five or so. Remember to get an offer on average. You're going to need to fill out somewhere between 20 and 40 and for you to be in a reasonable negotiating position in order to boost your salary, you're going to need to fill out a lot more. So you should get going on filling out those job applications if you aren't already, especially during these difficult economic times. And uh, the positive, again, is that remote work available all over. So you are doing a job hunt in a very unique national way. It's very cool. Um, there are many organizations in the past few months that have got written, gotten rid of what they call regional pay. This is uh, basically saying that you don't get extra money just because you live in San Francisco. That is fantastic for us here in Cleveland. Not great for the folks who live in San Francisco, but we don't care about them. Uh, for us, even half of their salary is a king's salary that buys you the greatest mansion in the city, whereas there it buys you a one-bedroom loft. So, <laughs> good news for us, bad news for them. Go on and search for those kinds of opportunities. And uh, yeah, let me know how it goes. Keep me posted too. Let me know if you're rate of callbacks and interviews is the same as I described. Let me know if you're doing better. I'm always happy to hear that our people get more callbacks than the average individual. Well, let's look at Chesterton's fence and how it applies to software. So here is the quote from, I believe his first name and middle name is G.K. G.K. Chesterton is a old intellectual writer, etc., and this is a quote that he wrote in favor of a particular kind of conservatism or traditionalism, in which case people are basically incentivized to honor the past instead of trying to plow their way through it progressively. But it's a very good quote to apply to software development. I'll just read it out here. There exists in such a case a certain institution or law, let us say for the sake of simplicity a fence or gate erected across a road. The more modern type of reformer goes gaily up to it and says, I don't see the use of this, let us clear it away. To which the more intelligent type of reformer will do well to answer, if you don't see the use of it, I certainly won't let you clear it away. Go away and think. Then when you can come back and tell me that you do see the use of it, I may allow you to destroy it. In terms of politics, which was Chesterton's main stomping ground, this basically refers to the concept that you should not try to get rid of any law, institution, uh, tradition, etc. that you do not understand the origin of, so why it was created in the first place and what purpose it serves, that you may cause more harm than good. It's easy to see how this applies to software, so the lesson to be learned for software developers, I think it's very clear, and that is do not try to refactor what you do not understand. Do not attempt to rewrite code that you do not understand in its fullness. If you don't grok it, don't touch it. So you need to know at least why something was written in the first place, because let's say that you are dealing with a large legacy code base and you run across a conditional for something that you perceive to be impossible. So let's say it's a uh, some kind of function that handles numbers between 0 and 100, and all of a sudden you run into a line that checks if x is greater than 100, which in your estimation shouldn't be possible. That shouldn't happen. Well, it obviously was necessary at some point. So now your goal is to figure out not what happens when I take this out and push it to production, but what is it that 
made the previous developer put this in? Why do they have this seemingly useless statement in there? So an important thing to think about as you are reading through legacy code. Another point to take from this is not to try to change the platform that your software is based on without understanding why the platform was picked in the first place. This is something that the industry has gone absolutely bananas on, and it's something that, as a whole, I think software developers need to curb before all software ends up being web-based electron junk or the functional equivalent of it. There are many examples of organizations out there that had nice old working legacy software and they decided to move it to the shiny new thing and now they still have nice old legacy software but they're also shy a few million dollars from trying to make the new thing work. Or worse, they don't have software at all anymore and they're shy a few million dollars as a result of it. So plenty of examples of that out there. If your organization has a big old monolith that looks terrible and is full of a ton of code and runs on an old back-end database that you want to get rid of, sure, by all means, but try to understand why they chose to do it that way and not immediately say, hey, let's migrate this monolith to Kubernetes and microservices. I'm going to call it Kubernetes, but... I think it should be pronounced Kubernetes. I'm, I'm going to stick to my guns there. Those are obviously two of the bigger fad you know, trends in software development right now. And again, uh, a lot of the time, you'll see organizations try to move to things like that when your perfectly reasonable legacy SQL database would do fine. A lot of you guys for senior design are running on a very weird backend. You're running on sheets and... I'm sure future developers, if they get a hold of your code, will look at it and go, why are these guys running on sheets? That's silly. Why don't they have a real database? Hopefully they know that you chose that platform for a reason. And then in general, the lesson to take away is that if a piece of code is working, even if you think that it is terrible, even if you look at it and you go, this is complete garbage, uh, something that's working should always garner a certain level of your respect no matter how bad it seems to be because getting software to be functional and having it do its job in production is not an easy thing at all so anything that satisfies those requirements something that's functional works in the production environment uh, that deserves a little bit of your respect so don't try to tear it all down and replace it if it's something that's already functional there are some opposite lessons to learn here, too. Sometimes platforms really are chosen for no serious reason, as I think was the case for most of you guys in senior design. You sort of settled on what you were going to settle on based on personal experience and that sort of thing. There really is no special reason that you picked certain platforms, or the reason might even be obsolete. Sometimes that means that the choice is incorrect and software really would be better served on a different platform, uh, but that's not necessarily the case. Just because a platform was chosen arbitrarily does not mean that it's not the right choice. Uh, you have to have a compelling reason to change. And again, if it works on the platform that it's on, sometimes that deserves enough respect to keep it that way. Sometimes, though, a piece of code really is horrible. Sometimes it really does deserve to be completely rewritten. That is true. Both of these things, the platform being chosen for the wrong reasons and code being terrible, are situations that you have to identify using a great deal of experience. It's something that you'll build up over your career. Don't default to those options. When you see something, assume that there's a reason for it to be that way until you understand it better and you can conclusively say that there isn't. So junior engineers essentially are trying to learn when a fence is a good fence, so when something that is a apparently a block to you or apparently an impediment is actually for the best, when that impediment serves a purpose and removing it would be a problem, uh, when an impediment is useless, so when a piece of code is just bad or a platform truly is an impediment, we had one group run into a web to pi dependency that they found to be pretty irreconcilable but it took a few weeks to get there. If they had identified that it was a big impediment earlier on, 
might have saved everybody some time. So identifying when an impediment is substantial is an important skill. And then identifying when something is just outdated. So when a impediment once served a purpose. So your your conditional statement that checked for greater than 100, maybe that's just legacy code from when the constraints were different, when it could take numbers larger than 100. Maybe it's a constraint that's based on resources that weren't available at the time. Maybe it's a constraint based on financial resources that weren't available at the time. You didn't have the, the server capacity to run more than 10 users or something, so you dropped everyone after 10. Well, that's a constraint that can change as your organization grows. And of course, your goals change, so requirements might shift based on that. And this is why the really important takeaway here is that when you create anything that might in the future be perceived as an impediment or be questionable as an impediment, make sure that you leave comments and describe why you did it, even if they're just inline comments and they're not necessarily anywhere else in the documentation. Leave other people comments. If Chesterton's fence had a big sign that said, no trespassing, it would be a lot more obvious whether we should remove it or not. If it had a sign that said, beware of dog, it would be very clear that we should not remove that fence, provided that we see an angry dog somewhere behind it, right? Uh, if it's a completely unlabeled fence, the case gets a lot less compelling. So make sure that you describe why you make impediments when you do. All right, that's it for the Chesterton's Fence of Software Development. Enjoy the rest of your senior design, and I'll see you in Discord.